Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. We are an open dialogue on culture and ideas with a particular focus on education. And the reason we're focusing on education is because I'm a teacher. So I call myself a teacher with a talk show. And we noticed that a lot of, you know, education is not really being represented on television as much as it ought to. And so we're trying to repair that silence. Uh, if you will, and to bring in some quality, substantive discourse on education in our media. And this program we're looking at uh, is something, again, we've been talking about for a long time, but with the COVID crisis and with a lack of democracy that we're facing now uh, is, is particularly crucial, which is what is the purpose of education? Right? Why do people go to schools? You know, And is it, is it more of a civic purpose or as now we see uh, education has simply become teaching for jobs and for the workforce. And if you look at the if you look at the posters for colleges, right? It's like, oh yes, you too can have a shiny career and make a lot of money, right? But you know, we, we, we want to look at. Uh, that's one reason we, we brought the people in here on this panel today. We have an all-star panel of people. We have Ira Shore, who is a friend of Paolo Ferrari, the great educational philosopher, uh, who worked with him. We have uh, Michael uh, Rebel, who was at Teachers College, who has. Uh, now initiated a landmark lawsuit against the state of Rhode Island. This is the first time this has ever been done, so this is breaking news, okay, uh, for failing to equip students with adequate civics education. Uh, and he brought uh, Meleke, say it again, Meleke? Melete. Melete, who just graduated from Providence High School, uh, and she is the plaintiff in this lawsuit, okay. In addition, okay, we have uh, Petal Robertson, who's the head of the Montclair Education Association. She's coming at us from the grassroots, bottom-up, democratic, uh, in Montclair, beautiful downtown Montclair, New Jersey. Uh, and also we have Michelle Fine uh, from the CUNY Grad Center, which has long been a hotbed of, of, of intellectual activity and social justice work. She's a psychologist, she's a feminist, she's a, uh, a social justice warrior, and we have an all-star panel here. So we're gonna look at this question. What is education for, in particular, education for a better world? Can we, can we start this going around that we need to teach for a better world? And can we talk about this on the big news shows too? Not just, I mean, we're, we're a cable show. We get, you know, not as many viewers as we would like, but why aren't they talking about this on, on, on the big media as well? That's another question that we can interrogate during this dialogue. And we will start with Michael Rebell, who uh, is our breaking news man of the moment with this lawsuit in Rhode Island. Michael, what is going on with that lawsuit? And can you clue us in on what's happening? Okay, well, we filed this case uh, actually more than a year ago uh, in uh, the Federal District Court in Rhode Island. And uh, what the case is seeking to do is to get a declaration from the federal courts, and that may mean possibility from the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, that students throughout the country, in Rhode Island at the start, but throughout the country, have a right under the United States Constitution to an education that's adequate to prepare them to be capable students. And there's a lot of legal background to this, but uh, to cut to the chase, it was um, about almost 50 years ago, 1973, that the U.S. Supreme Court, in a major decision, the Rodriguez case, uh, held that education is not a fundamental interest and essentially was not a right under the U.S. Constitution. Uh, and they said that um, there's not a word about education in the federal constitution. Uh, education is guaranteed by state constitutions. Uh, people who are not happy about um, uh, whatever it is uh, that concerns them in education can go to the state legislature, go to the state courts. And uh, that case had to do with inequities in financing education, uh, which has been a perennial problem. Your uh, viewers from New Jersey, they're probably familiar with the uh, Abbott case, which has been going on for, I don't know, 20 or 25 years. Uh, that case was filed as a result of the 
Supreme Court saying, take it to state court essentially. I brought a big case in New York State, the CFE case. There have actually been litigations in 47 or 50 states about fairness and funding. And plaintiffs have won about 60% of them. Um, but um, we've also lost 40% of them. It's been very uneven throughout the country. It's also um, been very uneven in terms of the uh, follow-up, uh, the remedies, how much the courts enforce them. Uh, so we reached the point of, of thinking that um, we do need uniformity uh, when it comes to clarifying the importance of education and a right to education. Um, and we went back and looked at that Rodriguez case. Uh, the Supreme Court left an opening there. I don't know if I'm going into too much detail. Yeah, you know what? My, why don't you just stick to like the, the broad theme of it? Because we don't have enough time to go too deep into the weeds of it. But and the other thing is your audio is not coming in as clear as we, we uh, would. You know, it's, it's maybe okay. you should come closer. Uh, but the whole idea. Better? Yeah. T tell us what is the historic nature of this lawsuit? This is the first time any state has been sued, right, for failing to uh, to uh, to provide civics education to the students. Why don't we just uh, turn to uh, Malate, the student who's in the pla the plaintiff? Tell us, uh, do you think you were deprived of adequate civics education, and and wh wh why did you get involved with this, Malate? Um. Yeah. I've been a part of the Providence Public School District ever since I started kindergarten. So it's been about 13 years in the system and I haven't been able to learn about civic duty or how to approach that. So like, I'm, I, ju I, just I just turned 18 this year actually. So like I was able to vote in the primary and I did not know what I was doing at all. And like, I feel like throughout high school, I wasn't given the opportunity to learn about this stuff. And it was only through like community based organizations like Arise and Prism that I was able to learn a little bit about it. And, yeah. Wow. Wow. And, and, and Michael, you know, first of all, your book is wonderful, Michael. I've been reading your book, Flunking Democracy by Michael Rebell. This is uh, it should be required reading for every American citizen, okay, uh, about how the schools are flunking democracy, okay? They are not adequately preparing people to live in a democracy. So we're all talking now about, like, someone like Donald Trump. How did he get in the White House, you know? Well, why don't we turn our attention toward the schools? You know, everybody who voted for Trump went through a, a K-12 education system, went to college, maybe studied business instead of stu studying something which would have taught them to think critically instead of studying you know history or humanities or things like that so that that's kind of a question we have to look at education in and politics how the two go together and and so michael we're so proud that you're doing this we're going to go back to you but for now let's turn over to pedal robertson out in montclair new jersey in the grassroots also an english teacher after my own heart i'm also an english teacher so tell, tell a little bit pedal how do you respond to this question of education and democracy and is it possible for teaching for a better world is that should that be the purpose of teaching or what what is your take on on the purpose of education well, I think it's important to note that knowledge, you know, you hear people say knowledge is power, knowledge is power, but knowledge is also control. And what we found too often is that in our systems now, in our curriculums now, there is more control being exerted over what that knowledge is. Because with the knowledge, when you come to the recognition of what things could be, what things should be, you're more likely to push back against those forces of power that are keeping things from being the way that they are, which is why you don't necessarily have the civic uh, education that you're supposed to. You don't hear about advocacy missions like you're supposed to. And it's sort of, we have now um, succumbed to these curriculums that design a world that suits a very capitalist structure that makes sure that there are that there will always be the haves and that there will always be the have nots and it starts in education it starts by what we decide to teach what we decide to um, allow people to know in my african american lit class what i we used to talk about this thing called the hog pen theory and mm. the hog pen theory is this idea that 
if you show a slave a hog pen, but you keep pointing to it and saying home, 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 they're going to associate that hog pen with home. But if they ever see you walk into your house and hear you call it a home, they're never going to want to go back to their hog pen again, because they're going to realize that's what a home is supposed to look like. That's what a home is supposed to be. And that's what the purpose of education is supposed to be. It's supposed to show us what homes really look like, what this world is really supposed to be, and what it looks like when everyone can eat, when everyone has a home, when everyone can make a living wage. But once, when we, if we don't want that, if those that are in control don't want that, the best thing for them to do is to control the information that you get so that you forever call the hog pen that you exist in, you forever call that home and you adopt that as your home and you never ever look for anything else because this is all you know. So if you become that student that graduates and you have the right to vote, but you know nothing about voting, the likelihood that you're going to exercise that right has significantly decreased. So when we talk about what is education for, education is supposed to be um, teaching young minds how to think, how to formulate opinions, how to view their world, not teaching them what to think and what they should see in their world. And as soon as we revert back to that, a lot of the things that we see currently going awry in our society would be mediated. Mm, mm. Wow, uh, Petal, I, can we get you to the Democratic Convention on time for tonight? I mean, you really, <laughs> your voice needs to be there. Uh, let's turn to Michelle Fine, and I want to thank you, Michelle, for also bringing Petal along. She's your friend. You recommended her to this to this panel, so thank you for that. And and Michelle, uh, what 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 you know, you could respond to what you've heard so far, and also you know, thinking about it in terms of the purpose of schooling, the purpose of education. Uh, what, what in your mind, you know, in terms of social justice, in terms of democracy, what should be the actual purpose of schools, uh, according to you? Um, so I'm, I'm very appreciative to be here with a bunch of friends, and it's nice to meet you. Maleke, yeah, close, not even close. <laughs> <laughs> Say it one more time. Malete. Melite. Okay, the exit. Um, I, you know, I, I want to reinforce Petal's sense of um, the schools we've created, and many people have said this before, Mabels and Gintis have said it most clearly, were designed in a way to reproduce the society we have. So by class, by race, by gender, the schools were designed to um, um, in Petal's language, convince people of their place, um, but, but also keep people from critiquing or imagining what else is possible. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I have had the, the joy in my life of working with educators in schools that dare to resist that. And, and uh -huh. Ira's friend, Paolo Freire, was someone I knew as well. And there's a, there's a group of critical pedagogy practitioners who have dared to imagine schools as a pit place for creativity, inquiry, for understanding social, racial injustice, and imagining what else is possible. There are schools that are now called community schools that work with local neighborhoods on the social movements that those neighborhoods care about. There are schools where um, young people come and really develop a kind of critical understanding of their own culture and language and other people's culture and language. Oh. Um, we have been radically set back over the last 30 years with neoliberalism, oh. with the undermining of public school educators, with the um, assault on teachers union, with the standards movement, and with the high stakes testing movement that has narrowed and codified um, the what rather than the how that I, that I think Petal was speaking of. And I love the idea that Michael and colleagues are moving, yeah. um, not past, but uh, expanding the commitment to finance equity to think about what needs to be happening in schools. My worry, of course, is that school districts will turn civics education 
into a thing, into a checkoff, into voting, volunteering, and reading newspapers, and that it will be about reading the Constitution, but not Colin Kaepernick. It'll be about voting, but not participating in Black Lives Matters protests. So the question is, how does one thicken the notion of civic education that it's deeply engaged as critique, solidarity, and possibility, and doesn't get flattened into a kind of whitewashed way of saying this is how you be a good civilized person in this country and becomes a form of exclusionary stratification, the etiquette of what it means to um, be a student rather than a creative, vibrant. And, and that's where I've been involved in a lot of these lawsuits around adequacy and around racial justice. And so often I, my heart breaks at the remedy. And, and Michael mentioned that because, you know, I love getting, I'm involved in one now in Baltimore. Kids are going to school with like no heat and no water and forget COVID, pre-COVID and mm. forget civics, forget real textbooks. They, um, mm. and, and the remedies are always so thin. And unless legal strategies are paired with activist strategies and rooted in community struggle. I just worry it becomes a kind of technical fix that never gets at the deep stratification that schools so systematically reproduce. Wow, wow, what, what, one second, let me, let me get the phone, hold on, I have to make a call, wait a minute. Uh, Joe Biden, please. Uh, Joe, I think we got your Secretary of Education right here. Yeah, her name is Michelle Fine, and she's as fine as her name. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Joe's busy, and so am I. <laughs> that was. That but what's amazing is is listening to someone like Petal, who's yeah. president of a labor union, speaking education justice, labor justice, and racial justice in one sentence. And oh. that's the kind of solidarity work that I think mm. we absolutely need. And maybe COVID has given us, and the uprisings have given us an, uh, an opportunity to understand schools need to be bridging all of those issues, labor, educational, and racial justice. Ira, let me introduce you, please. Hey, uh, uh, this is Ira Shore's book, Empowering Education, a great book on education, which I read uh, about 10 years ago, uh, actually after I met Ira at the Left Forum. He had given a lecture at the Left Forum. That's where I first met Ira. And my wife actually went out, went out and got this book for me. She found out how to get, did you, how did you get the book, honey? You ordered this? Or? Yeah. Okay. And here's what my wife actually wrote inside the book. She wrote this, my wife, my darling wife, Claudia. She wrote, John, to be a teacher is the greatest thing in the world. You can change minds, lives of the young people. Love, Claudia. June 2007. I handed this book to Ira Shore to sign it for me when we had lunch in Montclair, New Jersey. And Ira read what Claudia wrote. And then he wrote, Claudia is absolutely right. <laughs> Teach on. Ira Shore, best Ira Shore, January 30th. 2008. Um, most recently, I ordered this book, A Pedagogy for Liberation, written, co-written uh, by Ira Shore with his friend, his dear friend, Paolo Freire. And this is my example of a beach book, folks. This is what I read for fun, you know. Uh, so with that being said, one of the world's leading educational philosophers and thinkers, Ira Shore. Take it away, Ira. Thank you. So look, it's uh, great to be it's great to be uh, on uh, the session uh, with you folks. And uh, I followed Michael's work for a long time and uh, I, I'm just so happy to be looking at your face. I've never seen your face in motion, so this is wonderful. I've known Michelle for about 30 years or more and uh, there's no question she should be Secretary of Education. Uh, her contributions have been phenomenal in so many dimensions. She has worked with students and brought them out, uh, I believe you brought them to, didn't you bring them to a presidential convention some time back to do some research there, on-site research, I think. Well, anyhow, it's, uh, so uh, look, um, 
It's a complicated uh, question, and it's uh, always um, it's it's uh, it's probably good to always speak like exactly historically what what's going on. So Michelle mentioned uh, neoliberalism in the last thir thirty years. It's good to remember that in the nineteen seventies to the eighties, uh, students of color. Uh, closed 20% of the achievement gap with white students in that short period of time, about a decade from the 70s to the 80s. It was a remarkable advance. Now, uh, this, is, this is not deeply studied in, in education. Many things are studied, but this has been looked at, but not really appreciated in the depth that it, depth that it deserves. So um, uh, we might ask, well, uh, what was going on? to suddenly uh, give uh, uh, students of color such a, a lift, such a uh, step up. Well, there's, a, there's lots of things we could say about that time period. First, it was a, a season of, uh, of multiple mass movements, so that a lot of power from below was emerging at the, at the grassroots of, of all kinds. There was, of course, large uh, student movements on campuses and high schools. There was a uh, middle. There was some uh, labor movements, and uh, then a, a very militant women's movement began at the end of the of the sixties. There were civil rights and black liberation movements, and so on. I could go on, but I'm sure you, you know you know the list. So we're at a time of great foment and hope from below, so that uh, something spread that like um, hey things are changing and that they're improving for the better. And that this uh, this mystique spreads and begins to uh, generate a uh, desire to uh, to make society for yourself and make it better. Second thing is this it was also a, the period just before uh, neoliberalism worked its uh, worst effects on uh, working class and lower middle class uh, families. So that uh, we might say that. Uh, from 1945 to about 1970 or so, that it was the very best time in America to be poor working class and lower middle class. That in those times we know that families in those categories scored more economic gains uh, in their um, annual income than the, uh, the more affluent families who also got ahead, but not at as great a percentage as the families from the bottom up. This supported also a, a material uh, security at the bottom, and it was that uh, security, <coughs> plus other things, <coughs> that I think I would argue supported the the, the advance of black students. In addition to this long uh, black uh, civil rights and liberation uh, movements that uh, created uh, for uh, uh, created uh, forward motion, and also uh, that that was before. Um, what we know is like the intense impoverishment of the inner cities of America was effected. We've always had poverty and black folks have always had twice the unemployment rate of white folks uh, in no matter what the period, whether it's an economic uh, advance or an economic decline in good times and bad times, black folks have never been able to break the ceiling of 50% of twice the unemployment rate of, uh, of uh, white folks and also a half the family income rate, so that uh, this is all. This has been a steady uh, feature of uh, white privilege and white supremacy uh, in, in America is the the maintenance of this this economic what uh, um, uh, uh, corralling of, uh, of families of uh, of uh, color. But it, but neoliberalism in the nineteen seventies began a a very intense transfer of wealth from the bottom to the top. And this is when the, uh, the billionaire class really start to vastly expand its wealth. And with that wealth, the ability to buy political power and to buy the government at every level that, that, it, that it wants. And also to redesign the, uh, the spaces, the, the cities. Where that's also when gentrification being, um. got uh, launched. Uh, it started, at first it was called 50 years ago, it was actually called Manhattanization. <laughs> because Manhattan always like led the model. And I happened to uh, live in the West Village uh, for a few years, the end of the 70s until um, I moved out and so on. And I, I, you could see in the, the joke among us was is that, uh, the, that uh, gentrification was making Manhattan safe for brunch. <laughs> They're going to move out the poor and working oh. class people, people of color and whatever, the riffraff and, and bring in whatever. Well, yeah, that model has just become global. It's not just national as a 
urban model. It's become global. All the major cities of the world, in advanced countries, are uh, the rents are too high, and they're very they've pushed out uh, lower income. What this has meant is that the the impoverishment of, impoverishment of the inner cities has become intensified, even though. It was always economically behind the white communities. The intensification of it created uh, deep poverty that, um, that has, has grown worse decade by decade. That eventually had its effect. This is my analysis that by the uh, late 80s and 90s, that the inner city impoverishment and the, um, the, um, uh, the school to prison pipeline, which got started as well at the same time in the 1970s, and reached this apogee in the 1990s with a uh, six fold, 600% increase in the incarceration of black, uh, black uh, young people. That, uh, that all those combined began to stop this forward progress that uh, black families uh, were experiencing, uh, were, were managing under that and so on. So we, we have now posed before us uh, like uh, not, uh, not a single answer. That is, our, I, I do believe that for a hundred years we have known how to operate a school that mm. develops critical, that develops students into critical citizens and socially active uh, human beings. Mm. And we've known since uh, the period a hundred years ago when John Dewey uh, first started codifying uh, progressive education and student-centered methods and so mm. on. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's not like we, we have to invent the wheel now. Hmm. Uh, we have had these wheels for a hundred years and they, they keep getting locked away in the warehouse and thrown, the key gets thrown away. Ah. So we, we know what to do. And this critical pedag pedagogy that I've worked on from Paulo Freire for the last 40 years or so, that uh, it's, it's the latest uh, version of, uh, of, of that uh, beginning. And that Paulo Freire acknowledged that he stood on John Dewey's shoulders and he was very happy to say so in that Paulo Freire in the, from the 1950s to the 1970s was the modern version of John Dewey. And that after Paulo Freire passed, the rest of us uh, have to move on to the next reinvention of this. But what I'm trying to make is that we know, we already know what to do in school so that we bring out the, the, uh, the, the deepest learning capacities of our students. We are not allowed to do that. That's the problem that uh, this is why Paulo Freire said that uh, uh, education is politics, that, uh, w that politics are uh, power relations and the powers in society do not want that kind of schooling as it's mass education. It allows that education only for an elite fraction of its, of its students uh, because those students have to move on to uh, managing the society and to becoming the policymakers of the society and they need a different kind of education than the great mass of, of students. So we already know what to do in school. And uh, so now how do we get the political power so that we can do that in school? And these lawsuits are very important to try to crack the, uh, the, financing, uh, the financing inequity. Wonderful, wow, Ira, that's, that was powerful. I hope that becomes a YouTube in itself and gets a zillion hits, um, but you know, this whole idea of an educator as a politician, you actually wrote that, it was in this book, I just read that today as a matter of fact, when you had this dialogue with Paolo Freire, that an educator is kind of like a politician and also an artist. I think that's very, very interesting. I declared my candidacy for president twice, <laughs> mostly because I felt like these things need to be said in some kind of political campaign. And I, I walked around like a, like a lunatic handing out flyers, you know, hi, I'm running for president, you know, but it gave me a lot of agency. And, uh, but that, that all started from being in the classroom and talking politics because I come from a Freirean perspective. So all of my classrooms are all about social justice, how to make a better world, you know, that's just de rigueur, you know. So my students very often will say, hey, why don't you run for president? <laughs> And one day I said, let me, all right, I'll do it, you know? So anyway, that's, is very true. But, but I want to turn to uh, Malate after hearing that wonderful oration by Ira. What, what did, uh, what, what stood out for you, uh, Malate, and what Ira just said? I think, like, there's a lot of intersectionality when it comes to the educational system, like, just like, being a low-income student or 
me personally, I'm a daughter of refugees. So I didn't have the resources necessary or the support necessary in my schools. And like providing resources to students during this time because you are the future and they're the leaders of today now. I think it's just important and it's why I became a plaintiff to provide these resources now while they're still learning. And I wouldn't have known the things that I know if I hadn't joined these programs. So as I enter my life in college and into the adult world, um, I would have been ignorant to my rights as an American citizen. And I would have been just oblivious to all the systems of oppression that I face as a student or I face as a young female in America. So just elevating the voices of marginalized students or the communities such as English language learners or multi-language learners is really important to me. And just providing support opportunities and resources that would just end like the poverty cycle or yeah <laughs> mm, mm, mm. just like inequities that are prevalent in our current system yeah. wow, wow. Can, can i ask a question of uh, both malate and pedal sure um do, do you really trust that schools are the place? I, I, I'm thinking of what I can imagine you got from youth organizing and activism in in what town? Providence. We're in Providence, Rhode Island. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a there's the long tradition of of um, social justice organizing of young people, particularly immigrant young people, amazing youth activism. And I think about it for you too, Pedal. like this feels like a sad question, but can we imagine this work, expansive, vibrant, insightful, C-I-T-E-ful in schools? Um, particularly for students of color, like I could imagine in elite boarding schools. I know all the radical white supremacy stuff is being taught in a lot of elite private schools now, right? They're getting critical race theory, but I, I worry that we don't trust schools for kids of color. To, anyway, so it's, a, it's not a cynical question, but it feels like a sad question, but I've never gotten to ask it out loud, do you think this kind of democratic activist rooted in critical race immigration work, do you think it, it can and would be allowed to happen in, in schools, not just in like a buried Afro-Am class, English classroom where nobody's looking or, you know what I mean? Malate, I'll let you go first and then, <laughs> or you, I'm I'm fine well, to go first. Malakte, why don't you tell the folks here uh, about Arise? It's the organization he's been very active in. Yeah. What? I think so would... I'm a youth. I'm. A, I was a youth leader at Arise, and I turned into a junior facilitator. Arise stands for the Alliance of Rhode Island Southeast Asians for Education, and um, we provide resources for. Um, Southeast Asians, but also minority groups in general for like providing resources for like SAT prep, tutoring and stuff like that, which is not really available for um, minority people in Providence. Um, we also provide like emotional support and we have like several campaigns like Counselors Not Cops or um, yeah. uh, the lawsuit. <laughs> um, so I am a youth leader there and I sometimes facilitate um, meetings. I had just facilitated a meeting about Southeast Asian history and I was able to talk about Cambodian history and like the war that happened, yeah. that, that happened over there. Um, yeah. And I'm also a graphic designer for the community. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. So, so Michelle, I... I have to believe that it's possible because I think that's sometimes the only thing that will sustain me. And I, and I see it happening slowly. Like when we, we now have 
um, major associations like the New Jersey Education Association, the National Education Association, promoting the, the work of Dr. Patina Love and mm -hmm. talking about not just being, uh, and talking about actual anti-racist curriculums and pushing Amistad curriculums and watching that sort of turn. And even to personalize it a little bit, I again, I'm currently campaigning for the secretary treasurer position of in NJA. And one of the things, oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> you got delivered. <laughs> And one of the things, and what you're saying right now are one of the things that I say all the time, every time I'm campaigning, everyone I go to speak to, and the feedback that I'm getting overwhelmingly is yes. Yes, we're ready, we're ready. And it's about figuring out how, because what we're talking about is how do we tear down hundreds of years uh, of this sort of like institutional oppression that has been taking place and how do we rebuild it. And the beauty in the chaos of our current moment in society is that people are actually taking a real look at inequities in all types of institutions, not just for police, but for education and beginning to reimagine it. Now, my concern that I share with you is where do we decide to do this? And that goes back to the beginning uh, when we start, started talking about power. Do we put this in urban areas? Do we allow for these, to, these discussions, these classes to go beyond just African-American lit, but understand as the Amistad curriculum dictates that this is not a separate thing for you to learn about, but yet this is interwoven because when you talk about history, you can't negate the history of my people. That has to be in there. And my concern is that, do we get that to um, some of our inner city schools? Because that's where we need it the most. And I think we begin to do that when we begin to challenge the infrastructure, when we begin to change the minds of the educators as well. And we can do that through our community organizations, through our labor organizations, if we decide that this is something that we truly value, and it becomes one of those systems that if you part that if you choose to participate in this, you are participating with the knowledge of knowing that this is what we value. This, these are the things that we are going to articulate. One of the things I said for my um, local district, of course, my phone rings now. One of the things I said for my local district in Montclair, we created a branch of our local association that's dedicated solely to social justice work. And it's called the 846. We do restorative justice work in our association because the goal is to let people know that this is where we are centering our instruction. These are the things that we value and it becomes one of those, you're either gonna be so uncomfortable and choose to not be a part or you are going to start to learn and start to understand and start to partake. And that's where education has to move. I want to respond to Petal, what you just said there, which was wonderful. And again, that should be a YouTube that gets a zillion hits. Um, uh, I, you know, when you talked about the labor unions, it reminded me of something Ira wrote in his book that, you know, uh, how come the daily newspaper has a business section? It doesn't have a labor section, right? Seems like an obvious question. And I think these are questions that really have to be asked. Also, you mentioned about if, 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 if schools are good enough in the elite schools, why, don't, why doesn't everybody get that kind of quality education? I think AOC recently said something very similar. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, I heard her say something very, very similar. And, you know, Obama actually sent his kids to the, to the John Dewey School in Chicago, right? So, right, that's kind of a school that everybody should be able to go to uh, su such an excellent, democratic, liberating school, right? So, so uh, George Carlin, if anyone Googles George Carlin on education, anybody who hears my voice, do that, because he's got a five-minute YouTube where he says everything that we are saying right now, but he's very funny. <laughs> and he just says how, like, education has always been a club, right? Uh, or, or American society is a club run by powerful people, and you and me ain't in the club. And, and they don't want you to join the club, us to join the club. It's, it's very, very funny, very relevant. 
Um, say, John, too, I, I, I just one point that I want to put into the room. Yeah. It's also so important that it's not just the people that are in these um, communities that are advocating for this type of instruction. If I could afford the elite charter, if I'm in the elite charter, then I need to be the one voicing and saying, well, why isn't this also taught in that urban community? I need to be fighting for those levels of equity, too. And it's in that that we'll find real allyship. That's what real allyship looks like. It looks like bringing a voice to the table in a room that people that look like me may never be allowed to enter, or people of certain socioeconomic levels may never be allowed to participate in, but you bring those, you still bring those concerns to the table in recognition that it's wonderful that I may be able to afford a particular education in a particular town, but it's a travesty that this education is not being afforded to the other students as well. And oftentimes the people that have access to these types of education are also the people that have access to power. Also the people that are in these rooms in which the discussions are being had and the decisions are being made. And it's going to be imperative if we want that, that utopia sort of, Michelle, that you described, it's going to be imperative that those who, are, who have access and who have power use it to join our fight for equity. I wanna, I, I wanna, oh, go ahead, Ira, yes. John, I think, um, Milwaukee yep. and, and I are going to have to cut out, but you had said this was six to seven, and uh, it's after seven now. Um, so this is been... see you, I, I, Michael. Michael, wait a second, Michael. Before you go, I want to show you something. Michael, don't leave. I want to show you something. Where are you going to school, Maleke? Um, I will be a uh, first year at Smith College. Oh, sweet. Oh, sweet. I have my son teaches at a community college in Montcl in uh, New York City, and one of his students is on her way there. I'm going to get, I'll get your email and connect you up, and you will be sisters in struggle, I promise you. She's a Haitian American, kick ass, beautiful. Yeah. Uh, well, that's great. Congratulations. Thank you. Michael, I want to show you this. That's the article that was in the New York Times. It's been hanging on my kitchen wall for two years. That's how, that's how blown okay, away. I, I have seen that article. <laughs> Thank you. Listen, I just before I go, I, go I just want to say two quick things. Um, you started this conversation asking what is the purpose of education. And yes. One thing that um, most people don't know, but you should be aware of it for advocacy, for organizing. Um, I mentioned there have been lawsuits in 47 states about fiscal equity. Most of those courts, uh, before they get to the question of how much money do you need for education, uh, they get the first principles and they say, well, before we talk about how much money you need, we have to decide what's the purpose of education. Mm. We've had um, 33 highest state courts articulate in the 20th and 21st century what the purpose of education is. And every one of those ones have said the prime purpose of education uh, is to prepare kids for good citizenship. Hmm. They usually say to prepare for the uh, world of work also, but they emphasize the citizenship. And I'll tell you, the definition of a sound basic education, which is the right of every student in New York State, the definition from our highest court is that a sound basic education is um, an education that prepares them to function productively as civic participants, capable of voting and serving on a jury. So if you, have, if you had had that definition in Rhode Island, Milwaukee, we could have said that the schools were not doing what the court said is your constitutional rights. One reason we brought the case in Rhode Island is their court has not stepped up to the plate and they refuse to even consider the issue. So we went to Rhode Island and said the federal courthouse. The other thing I just want to say in response to Michelle, when you were talking about what are the remedies in these cases lead to? Well, I can tell you in New York, having that definition, which has been powerful, and we've been able to push civic education there. We got the Regents, which is our Board of Education right. for the state. Um, they recognize that they've got this constitutional obligation a couple of years ago, they changed the stated goals of education in New York State. 
which had been preparing kids for college and career. And that's what most states say is the purpose of education. In New York, it's now officially college career and civic readiness. And um, they also appointed a task force to help them figure out what does civic readiness mean? And I was asked to chair that task force. We've come out with a really robust, strong definition of what civic education means, and it responds to a lot of the things you said, Michelle. We not only talk about deep knowledge, we talk about civic uh, skills, critical analytic thinking, media literacy. We also talk about civic experiences, um, getting involved in community work, action projects. Um, so uh, picking up on what the court said, we have been able to start moving the ball in New York. And that's why we brought this national lawsuit because we want to start making inroads like that in Rhode Island and quite frankly, in every other state around the country, if we can really get this concept embedded in the federal law. And ideally, you know, there's no guarantee the Supreme Court would take this case, but our aim is win or lose in Rhode Island and in the First Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, we're going to push as hard as we can to get this case to the Supreme Court. Wow. Anyway. It's really important, Michael, and it creates a wedge for the kind of anti-racist civic curriculum and pedagogy that Pedal's talking about, that I'm talking about, and that the moment demands. My worry about democracy and civic is they can get very vanilla, flat, and and used to sideline anti-racist right. or anti-queer or anti-immigrant, whatever, um, much more vibrant, well, critical, I, civic work. Yeah, I agree but with you But you create a wedge. You create an yeah, opening. That's, you're and, exactly right. And, and you know, my whole philosophy of, of lawsuits is they can create um, really important breakthroughs they can uh, start people thinking in different directions, but uh, it's got to be worked with social reform, with advocacy groups. Totally. And when we start a case, as in Rhode Island, you know, we try to link up with groups like uh, like, like a rise. Uh, youth group, yeah. uh, with the uh, NAACP, uh, yeah. with the labor groups up there, really and get them all interested in this case, so that if and when we win, they can go on to take the action that's necessary to no, make no. changes on the ground. And that's, that's my theory of what law reform is, and I think it, it very much complements your theory of how the courts can be used. Anyway, I've got to run, John. Michael, thank you so Very much uh, for joining. The situation on, on our democracy right now with Trump in the White House, is this the result of bad education? This is something we, we have to talk about as a country. And also, why is it that the things we're saying here in this program are not being talked about on mainstream media, on MSNBC and CNN, right? And what, what will it take to have this dialogue go out to millions of people? Okay, I'm going to leave you all. <laughs> okay, my I want to I'm wish gonna... you a great first year in college, sweetie. Yes. We're lucky to have you. Yes. Thank you. Congratulations. Good luck, Michael. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. Um, what I've learned is that legal struggles should always be connected to social movements. And I, I worry when legal, you know, we're, three of us are in Montclair. We've seen the consequences of what's called integration. And it's a sad stratified system. And so unless there's an attachment between a law and a social movement, and the other linkage that I think came out of this is that we should never talk about democracy without talking about anti-racist commitments and democracy. Because if democracy is used as a cover story to launch wars, to invade countries, unless we're specific about undoing and decolonizing the racial and class inequities that sit underneath our social structures, democracy can sound like voting or one vote. And I just think we should give a little bit of a bite. So that's my friendly amendment to John Dewey. Stay, stay yeah. with us, Michelle. Well, I just want to mention, Ira, real quickly. There's a, you have, we have three Montclair residents here. There's another Montclair resident named Stephen Colbert. 
Now, yeah. what, that, that, in terms of dreaming big, thinking big, what, what will it take to get this on the Stephen Colbert show? Uh, I mean, you guys go to the same supermarket as him, right? Why don't you yeah. say, hey, Stephen, what, get with the program. I'll try to buttonhole him next time. <laughs> Please. Uh, I can only directly answer your question that um, education, public schools have had nothing to do with uh, this current uh, crisis that we're uh, let me put it, nothing to do that they're not responsible. Uh, education, public schools, school systems cannot produce an economic crisis. Uh, and they have um, not produced um, the uh, Donald, uh, Donald Trump, Donald Trump uh, won by a quirk of the electoral college system that we inherit from slavery times, from uh, oh. the writing of the constitution on the influence of our, of our slave owning uh, founding fathers and so on. So this is like a very old problem that has to be, has mm -hmm. to be uh, addressed. Also uh, that um, the democratic party unfortunately has uh, abandoned some of its key constituencies uh, that uh, been won over as Reagan Republicans uh, 20 years ago and uh, 30 years ago or 40 years ago, excuse me. Uh, and um, the Democratic Party has moved to the right and unfortunately has not provided an alternative. So we've been watching it and uh, every administration has gotten more conservative than the one before, including the Obama administration and so on. And um, so now we're, we've reached it. We've reached after 40 years. Where do you wind up? You wind up in, in the arms in of, yeah, in Donald, the arms of this creature called Do Donald Trump. So there's no, there's no, there's no tweaking or tinkering that can uh, simply repair the vast damage that Trump and the 40 years have done. So we now have to like become very ambitious. And we have mass movements in the streets and 25 million people marching mm. for Black Lives Matter and so on. So this is like, like, the, like uh, Dickens said in the Tale of Two Cities, this is the worst of the times and the best of the times. Mm. Because finally we have uh, some tools to really uh, make things better, the tools of mass opposition that's from uh, coast to coast in, in uh, what, 700 towns and cities have seen, have seen marches. What we now need to do is have a lot of uh, organized consolidation Folks have to, this is uh, what Malachi mentioned with um, intersectionality, yeah. that we, all, we have to now uh, be very patient with each other and uh, figure out how to act, act together and to, uh, to where the, the most vulnerable pressure points are to push for, uh, push for rent control, because mm. rents are out of control, to push for small class size, to push against uh, racist police and police violence, the push for against mass incarceration and so on and so on. We we now have to adopt this uh, this very uh, this this consolidated platform that brings all the all the interests of uh, of society uh, from the bottom up together in in a very vibrant opposition. So uh, look, uh, half the time I feel like uh, some we're on the verge of something good happening, and half the time I want to run for cover. Because, uh, you know, the, other, the bad guys uh, seem to be as crazy as ever yes. and so on. So uh, we're, wow. we're going to have to play this out and everybody's going to have to be outside. Mm. We're all have to be, the people have to be outside. And yes. the more we're outside, the more be better things will happen. Wonderful. Paddle, could you throw a few words in toward the end? Sure. I'll, and, and I'll be brief. I, think, I don't think that um, education is the cause for where we are now, but I do think that education is going to play a big role in the solution to where mm -hmm. we are now. Because mm -hmm. what you, the, the students that you see in the streets, those students, I guarantee you had at least an educator who helped promote that, who helped plant that seed of advocacy, of, um, uh, of opposition in them. So with education, as we begin to rethink what education looks like, then we're going to start to see a change. That's when we will actually see a change. And just um, sort of what Ira and both Michelle said, when we think about it from the point of view of labor associations, I think there has to be some correlation with how this country began to treat labor associations and when we started taking this turn for the worse. Because if you think about it at the crux of a labor association, at the crux of an education association, is this idea that we all work for the betterment of each other. And if it affects Petal, it affects Michelle, it affects Ira. And I'm gonna advocate for, I'm gonna advocate for Michelle who is 
in a state that I don't eat, that I've never been to in my life, but I recognize that her well being is intrinsically tied to mine. And that's the idea of union. And you negotiate, you bargain, you advocate with the idea that all people are important and all people wow. need to be taken care of. Pedal, and pedal. That, oh, wow. Thank you. On that note, I just want to say thank you all for being part of this dialogue and to our audience watching. Um, you know, just to let people know who might be a little confused about what we're doing here, you know, this is not exactly a breaking news show. Uh, it's not exactly a educational conference, right? Although it sort of has elements, you know, of both. It's something new that we're trying. And if this was a little messy and sloppy and sort of fumbling through, we're just trying to create a dialogue in America. We're trying to spark a national dialogue on what the true purpose of education should be, and particularly to try to steer it toward a more civic democratic purpose, what we call teaching for a better world. And we wanna do this again, and when we finally come out of COVID time, we wanna do this in real time, in the actual rooms, and you know, in auditoriums, and have like town halls on this, and bring politicians in it. So we would love for you to keep this conversation going with your friends, with your neighbors, and your family members, and for the people watching, to keep asking, we have to talk about this. What is the true purpose of schools? I don't think we've ever really had a national conversation on this. And the final question I'm going to ask you, because it seems like some really smart, radical people live in Montclair. Claudia and I, we're going to have to come out. We live in Hoboken. The train goes right to Montclair. Any, what's the cool restaurant that we should be checking out? They're all closed. Oh, they're all closed. <laughs> Not, oh, come on. They're all going broke. Oh, I'm oh, sorry to hear. Oh, any, anything, any. <laughs> thank you. So nice oh, the you. conversation thank will go on. The conversation. Bye bye, everybody. God bless you all. Thank you so much for thank being part you. of this. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, John. Thank, thank you, Ira. <laughs>